Hello and welcome all to a very exciting event to kick off our 2024 events program here at the IFG. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Joe Owen. I'm Director of Impact here at the Institute. 2024 is going to be an election year. The Prime Minister has said his working assumption is that a general election will take place in the second half of the year. Working assumption isn't the strongest political commitment we've seen, but the odds and crucially the IFG's internal sweepstakes suggests <laughs> that an autumn election looks likely. There have only been two elections since the 1980s where the party occupying number 10 has changed. If the exit poll this year looks, like any, looks anything like the current polls, we might expect to have our third. The Labour Party, after 14 years in opposition, could find themselves in power, possibly within hours of the exit poll dropping. So today we are going to be asking how should an opposition prepare for government? What lessons have we learned from our recent past? And I'm delighted to welcome a fantastic panel to discuss that question. On the far right of the stage, Wes Ball, former director of the Parliamentary Labour Party. On my immediate right, Baroness Kate Fall, former deputy chief of staff to David Cameron. On my immediate left, Dr. Catherine Haddon, director of the IFG Academy and our resident expert on transitions. And last, but by no means least, Lord Nick McPherson, permanent secretary of the Treasury from 2005 to 2016. I'm going to start by asking them some questions before opening to the floor. I'm going to leave plenty of time for audience questions, so please do get them ready. Um, if you're watching online and have a question, please do use the Q&A function and we will look to include as many as possible. If you don't have a question but more of a comment, please do tweet it with the hashtag IFG General Election. I'm sure there will be plenty of things we don't manage to squeeze in today. Uh, but don't worry, there is an excellent report on exactly this question that we published last week for you to really see, sink your teeth into. I'm going to start by turning to one of those report authors, Kath. Thank you. Uh, to just explain a little bit about how the transition of power works in the UK. How does that compare to other countries and what does that mean for oppositions and how they need to prepare for government? Yeah, um, well, you've already hit on one of the major uh, things that typifies the UK approach, which is if there is uh, a change of government involving a majority win, so a majority of seats, uh, then the change happens overnight. Um, it is usually midday, the day after polling, uh, that you then see the trip to the palace and a change of government with the government being formed in the days thereafter. And uh, for the report, we did a bit more delving into how other countries do it. Obviously, everyone's aware of the US approach, which is markedly different, and a three-month period uh, between uh, polling day and uh, a new administration taking office. Uh, but even comparable democracies, uh, Canada, Australia, have a few days, sometimes a few weeks, uh, between the election day and a, a government taking office. And we, we spoke to people involved with that and they, they talk about how important that is because you're so focused on campaigning, you don't have a, a great opportunity to then think about, okay, how are we gonna put this into practice? Who are we taking into government with us? In the UK, because it happens exhausted after a long campaign and often very little or no sleep overnight after the election, that means that all the preparation happens beforehand. So the UK has evolved lots of different um, ad hoc and semi-formalised arrangements for how that, that process happens. Um, but still, even now, some of those processes are very much dependent on uh, the political parties of the day working out for themselves how to go about doing that preparation. So one of the reasons why we wrote the report is because we think that the good practices that we have seen in recent elections should be something that more opposition parties should be aware of when they're starting off on this process so that they're given a bit more of a guide about the kinds of things that you need to be doing in the years and particularly the year uh, approaching a potential general election and, and what you should focus on. So that's uh, lots of good lessons in the report. Please read it. Um, Kate, I'm going to come to you next and ask you to cast us back to late 2009. Uh, how did things feel uh, with less than a year out to the general election? How much preparation was happening for what might lie on the other side and what did that preparation look like? So on, if you're working in a political team um, heading into a general election, your entire focus is on winning. 
So I think the, the first problem in, in, in this discussion about transition is even the whole thing is election, election, election. And the thing you most dread is complacency, either at the ballot box or within your team, um, or a sense of hubris. Hubris is literally the killer of a general election campaign and is often uh, um, uh, comes into the end of a campaign. We can think of so many examples of the Edstone or you know, Stephen Kinnock at the rally, but it really is something that, that, that term, time and time again. So literally none of the inner team on an election campaign will be thinking really about transition. What you will be thinking of, however, is um, what, what, you know, your manifesto, you know, what, what, what are your big offers, your big retail offers, what are you selling to the people of Britain? And that obviously is something that the, you know, the civil service will be looking at sort of very, very closely indeed. And then you are also thinking about, you know, if you won, who would be in your government? Because those people are already in your team. They're already your shadow cabinet. Not all of them, by the way, will make it over that, that um, transition. And of course, in, in this particular election, we formed a coalition five or six days after that election. And the people who thought they were going to get those posts didn't all get them. And that caused a whole raft of other problems. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing I would say is... Um, there is a sense of we did, of course, work on a grid with the possibility of coming into government. And that would, that would be, be focusing on, you know, how can we show the country we've changed? How can we show the country what the values are of this new government? And we were very aware of when it had been done successfully in the past, that with Gordon Brown and, and, and Blair with the Bank of England. So symbolic value-led first days was, was very much in focus. And there were some people working on transition. Um, I believe George Osborne, but Nick will talk about that. Um, saw Nick in the run-up of that. But on the whole, I would say that the main positive and negative is that you really are just focused on clinching that deal with the electorate. Wes, does that ring true for your experience, uh, thinking back to the preparations that you were um, a key part of in the run into the 2015 election? Does much of what Kate said ring true there, or are there things you did differently? Absolutely, and <clears throat> that's, what, that's one of the lessons that we learned from the 2009-10 experience was the need to separate out your team that's thinking about how you will run the government, how you will deliver the policies that you've put in your manifesto, the other commitments that you've made. We were thinking about how to separate that out from the politics because the brilliant people you've got that are going to form the core of your government are just focusing on the election campaign, and that is right. That is the right thing to do. Um, so you do need another team that can think in a, in a kind of much more prosaic, programmatic, managerial sense about how you're going to do it. What are the choices that you're going to have to face in the first few, week, few days, few weeks, few months, so that, you can, so that there is a plan there that you can provide to people to get going with when you do that. And that was, separating that out was a really important lesson that we learned and I think that, we, that was really effective for us. And I think it's a lesson that the current uh, Labour leadership are also operating on. And I think it's, it will have benefits for them. Um, Kate, you mentioned this, but uh, Nick, you have seen a few transitions in your time, or a couple of them at least, from being permanent secretary at the Treasury for the 2010 and 2015 elections, as well as principal private secretary to the Chancellor in 97. What were some of the most successful ingredients that you saw kind of the other side of the door into government? What what showed you that more or less preparation had, uh, had taken place? Well, I think there, there are two sides to this. There's the civil service, the sort of permanent side of government, and then there's the political side. And I think the civil service needs to be ready. In the final year of a parliament, there tends to be less going on. So it's an opportunity in a non-political way to review the department strategy, so in the case of the Treasury, we knew there was going to be a spending review um, shortly after the election because the, the existing plans were running out quickly. So there was an awful lot of work which just needed to be done, whoever the government was. And I think that's important. But I think the other thing is to take the opportunity of the formal discussions with the opposition, which my recollection kicked off um, a good, a good year before January the. January two thousand nine. Yeah, they went on for a long time. Now that doesn't look. The opposition is generally in the business of trying to win, 
it does not want to spend lots of time talking to boring civil servants, but, um, <coughs> and, and who can blame them? But the discussions do provide an opportunity first to build a relationship so that when the government gets in, you can hit the ground running. And secondly, to get a sense of what the immediate priorities are and were. So Kate actually has um, triggered a memory that a week before the election, George Osborne got in touch and said, can you come around? And he wanted to um, make clear that if the Tories did get in, within a week to 10 days, they would want to announce a whole lot of in-year cuts in public spending. And um, look, at that point, my job wasn't to advise him, but um, it did give us a good sort of thing to focus on, not least because um, uh, the first thing you're asked to do is a really good litmus test of whether the civil service machine is up to the job. And you know, you fail an early task, and that's likely to um, uh, cause quite a lot of um, uh, damage to the relationship. And at a, a self-serving level, if you're a permanent secretary and you fail an early task, my guess is your days may be reasonably numbered. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, there were a whole lot of things which George Osborne wanted to do quickly. We spent the election period working on those along with lots of other things. Um, and I'd like to think we were reasonably ready to um, hit the ground running, even though there was a coalition, which actually gave us another 10 days or so, or a week. Um, it, it, it did mean, though, that life... I, I remember going around to the, the Department for Trade because I'd been um, Ken Clark's private secretary in the 90s to give them tips on <laughs> working with Ken Clark. But then, because of the coalition, Vince Cable uh, <laughs> became the president of the Board of Trade, which meant all my hard work and useful tips came to nothing. And I was too busy to talk to the Minister of Justice when he was belatedly appointed. I'm sure they're written down somewhere. Um, Kate, did you want to come in on that? Yes, I just wanted to um, add two points. The first is my experience of coming in um, into government was the, the machine, as they like to call it, um, likes to be told clearly what, what you want it to do. And the best times we were in government um, it was when they were very clearly told. Where their problems are where you get people, either, either they're not in control of the party and you get this infighting and then no one knows what's going on, or indeed at the centre, there's a sense that someone's saying one thing. For example, had George Osborne and David Cameron not had such a strong relationship, that might have created a bit of a sort of, hang on, he said this or he said that. That's the first point. And just another, if I may, um, I, I, did, I did have one pre sort of, government meeting, which was 10 days before the um, election. Jeremy um, Hayward, who's sadly no longer with us, a, a brilliant civil service and a fantastic colleague, asked to meet Ed Llewellyn, who was the chief of staff, I was the deputy, um, to have a chat about how we would run number 10. And um, I was extremely excited about this meeting because I thought it was a sure sign we were going to win the election, mm -hmm. whereas Ed Llewellyn <coughs> said he was simply hedging his bets, which I'm sure <laughs> was more correct. But that was a really important meeting because I, I, you know, what Jeremy Hayward was trying to get out of that meeting was just a feel for a team who'd spent five years in opposition together, how we would bring um, that sort of, in a way, intimacy of an in inner circle, a close election team, into this very important centre of government. Can I, can I just come in on that? Because it's, uh, it, it's, it's easy to focus on policy, which mm. is the sort of easy bit. I think the biggest challenge when there's a change of government is the, is the cultural yes. one, especially when there have been long periods in power of one dominant party. And I saw this at first hand in 1997, where um, uh, you know, Labour got in for the first time in many years, neither um, Gordon Brown nor Tony Blair had been ministers. At least David Cameron and George Osborne has been special advisors, which had given them some idea mm. of how Whitehall worked. And the Treasury put huge amounts of effort into understanding Labour's policy in 97. In fact, far too much time, because 
actually, you know, Tony Blair made pretty clear that, you know, one shouldn't believe everything you read in the manifesto. And in any case, independence of the Bank of England wasn't there. The problem was far more just how you worked with a very tight-knit team who'd been working very successfully together, like Kate's team in, in, in 2010. And the world had moved on. The Treasury only had one mobile phone in the press office. Um, you know, I, Ken Clark never came into the office before 9.30 a.m. and he thought breakfast meetings were completely pointless. And um, whereas I was the principal private secretary who one day was serving Ken Clark, next day, um, you know, serving um, Gordon Brown, and Gordon Brown turned up at 5.30 in the morning. I thought I'd been <laughs> really clever in getting up at 8 a.m. <laughs> but I arrived to find a security guard who was a bit flustered because he'd had to unlock the <laughs> chancellor's room. So, and, and I had had conversations with Ed Balls. Um, I'd gone out and had two very good lunches with him in the run-up to the 97 election. And, yeah, we, we dealt with things like the special advisors having a having a sort of um, desk in a private office, but we hadn't really dug deep into Gordon Brown's psyche and working practices. Kath, you wanted to come in and then Wes. Yeah, I mean, it's really just to reiterate some of these points. Preparation has to have its limits. You can't, you know, it can't lead to complacency. The election is, of course, the priority. So it's about being focused on the things that you do need to do and where you need to direct your energy. You can't think about every single policy in a huge amount of detail, the kind of work that you're going to do in government. So it's about prioritising where are the areas that you want to come in with, you know, some early legislation that's going to get into the King's speech or uh, something that you want to announce on day one. And that's where it's incredibly important if you want to have those, those kind of early successes, not only to do the preparation yourself, think about the political trade-offs, think about the sequencing of all of the work that different departments might be doing, but also to have those conversations with, um, with the civil service. But the other thing that isn't talked about enough is that preparation of people and thinking through who are the team that are going in, you know, because people forget that it, it takes a few days. I mean, it's only the, towards the end of the first day that the cabinet is being appointed, let alone the rest of the ministers often over a weekend when it's an election on a Thursday, um, let alone special advisers, where it can take sometimes weeks to get them into the job, usually in number 10, because of these conversations they're in early. So it still takes time to get a government up and running. And if you're doing some preparation to think about these kinds of issues and, and to help people understand what the challenges are going to be going into government, then it's going to help you more in those early days. That, that's the, the key thing to understand, I think. So I'll come to Wes and then it would be good to drill into some of the how do you prepare a team and the people and I'll mm. come to you on that if that's okay, Kate. Okay. But Wes. I, I just wanted to pick up a bit, a bit about this point about policy. We were never, you know, I, my team was never successful in getting over the line. So the people stuff, I think, I can't give it experience on. But, but <clears throat> we, we put a lot of effort into the policy work because, and you know, oppositions make policy commitments that hang around for a long time <laughs> that are based on a whole load of reasons that aren't to do with good government. They're, you know, they're kind of like political trade-offs, political signals, they haven't thought them through, you know, the pressure from a particular uh, group in the back benches or something like that. And they're just, you know, hanging them all together into a tree that looks like a tree is quite difficult. And um, it was, we spent a lot of time, and we had the advantage of having a fixed term parliament, so we knew when the election would be and we could aim for it. And my team spent a lot of time working with advisors and working with the Shadow Cabinet members individually to think through how those policies would hang together as a plan within a department, a plan for government, a plan that had a manifesto that told a story that was true to Labour's values and something that could be delivered. And then we spent a lot of time as well working on our key central planks of that and how we wanted to deliver them. There was a degree of scepticism about whether um, uh, the civil service that we had find we would find, which had changed a lot in the five years that Labour had been out of government at that point, would have the capacity because staff numbers had declined, 
or would or would instinctively understand what we were trying to achieve. So we so we wanted to create these political masts that we could hold on to in the storms of being in government. Um, and so putting that effort together was quite important to us. Before we go <coughs> to people, just on policy, one of the criticisms in the media of the current opposition and actually lots of oppositions mm. throughout history is the amount of policy detail that is available. How did you decide how much policy detail to go into or to put out into the world during that process? Well, firstly, I don't think it's fair about this government, uh, this, this Labour Party, uh, because, you know, the five missions for government, as you indicate in your excellent report, sort of put together a plan for how government will operate. Now, you know, it's going to be quite challenging to put that into place, I think. Um, and I think Rachel Reeves has set it out pretty clearly in her speeches about how she wants to run the economy. Um, question, therefore, is... And then the, the National Policy Forum document actually spells out quite a lot of policy in there. I think it's just a case of read it, pay attention a bit more, but I get why people don't. Um, <laughs> uh, how much did we do? I think we put a lot of focus on the key things that we thought were the most important things and less on the other bits and bobs, you know, bits and bobs for obvious reasons. You know, we had real capacity issues, and I think every opposition has real capacity issues. You know, the civil service is a fantastic machine that can deal with all of, you know, the whole range of challenges facing the state. The opposition cannot and because I've said we want to you shouldn't isolate transition you isolate transition to a handful of people yeah just, uh, to come in. just to say I mean this is not a new phenomenon there's when I go and do talks on uh, preparation for government I always use a, a cartoon from 1979 which shows Margaret Thatcher holding up two shopping bags and one is says labor goods on it and it's it's sort of massive and bulging and all the things that they're criticizing labor for and the other one says Tory goods and it has this little note on it saying we'll tell you once we've won the election <laughs> um, so it is not new for an opposition party to um, you know prioritize what it's talking to the world about thinking um, mm -hmm. in terms of the election and to also um, be thinking about well there's a difference between that and then mm. all the things that we'll then have to do and that we'll inherit when we get into government both Thatcher and Blair um, you know there was a lot around the sort of the vision and the the, the language and the way in which they were presenting themselves, but the amount of policy detail has crept up massively in um, manifestos in recent years. I did once do a project where I was counting, not actually counting, I used the word, uh, but working out the number of policy priorities in manifestos going back to the 1950s, and there's various data about it, um, and it has massively shot up. So there is this increasing pressure that we put on our opposition parties to have a policy for everything going into an election. If, if I may, just, yep. I do think, though, you, you do, the point of a manifesto is also to say this is what I'm about, but it's also to give you a mandate when you yep. enter government. And, I mean, Nick was talking about um, those in-year spending, but had um, um, my party at that time under David Cameron not actually said to the electorate what they were planning to do, I don't think we would have had the political currency to make the changes that, that we did. And the fact that we did it with the Lib Dems was, in a way, the cement that, that stayed with us the whole way through the coalition. So I think it's important to be clear what you're about. Yeah. I'm going to go back to the, the people yes. thing that we touched on. And I'll just be interested, you, you touched on it slightly with the conversation that you had with uh, Jeremy about how the team worked. But was there anything you did as a team in the run into the election to sort of prepare you as a unit for a possible transition into number 10? And is there anything that you did individually? Is there anything you can do individually to prepare yourself for that change? I mean, I think the quick answer is I don't think I was prepared in the sense that one day you're fighting an election campaign and the next day your office is number 10 Downing Street. And I remember waking up and sort of getting my prep coffee and walking, and then you could only walk in the front. So you have a bank of photographers knocked on the door, quite overwhelming. <laughs> enter number 10, more overwhelming, and then think, well, what do I do next? <laughs> because <laughs> I, I'd never been there, you know, never been there before, didn't know where I was supposed to sit, all this sort of very, I mean, quite obvious things. It, there's no HR person turning up saying, you know, this is your email. So, I mean, I think that, that is, that's huge. That's the first point. The second point is, 
we all we had a very strong team and we knew what our what we were there to do so that was i think the good part of our team i'm sure there were lots of negative parts but so we we knew we would fit into those roles when we went into number 10 but of course you've been working in politics you've been influencing running the opposition but when you're in government you're there to support the prime minister and work with officials to help run the country which is rather a different job and i'll finally just mention the the, the third point the officials i mean that that is a huge difference because you enter um the rolls royce machine as they say and it is by the way i know not everyone has that experience but if you work in te number 10 you normally work with the best um, and you're suddenly alongside these brilliant people who are telling, who are calling the Prime Minister Prime Minister while you're still calling him Dave. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're looking at you like, eh. Um, and there's a bit of a culture clash there, but it takes a bit of a while to iron that out. When it works well, though, it does work very well. Nick, I want to come to you on this and just the importance of uh, the relationships between the officials and the new ministers or advisors in those early days are. Uh, excellent Ministers Reflect Archive is littered with interviews uh, with former ministers talking about the total washing machine of the first few days and not knowing how or which way is up. Just how important are those relationships at the very top of the shop in those first few days? I think they're really important, obviously. Um, but, you know, making, making them work is, is challenging. I think, um, I mean, I was lucky enough to meet George Osborne, you know, quite, quite a number of times in the run-up to the election. I'd had a couple of informal dinners which had been orchestrated by a mutual friend. So we kind of knew each other equally. You know, I, I must have appeared like some sort of new Labour stooge. I'd been on the long march of, of sort of Gordon Brown from 1st of, 1st of May, 97, through to 2010. And, um, and in fact, uh, you know, fairly early on, George Osborne did ask me when I was planning to go. Um, <laughs> and um, he, he made the mistake of saying that he wanted someone to stay for the whole parliament, um, <laughs> which I subsequently committed to. So, but to be fair, actually, so there's, I think, a degree of suspicion, but equally, I think you're sort of being put to the test. Can you deliver? Um, do you understand what we're about? You know, have you, have you got well-developed plans for implementing it? Are you, do you recognize the importance of the wider team? Special advisors, really important. And actually, you know, if. And they were really important in 97 too. I think the Treasury was far slower in 97 to understand how the, the Brown regime would work, and in particular the importance of Ed's Bulls and Miliband and to a lesser degree Charlie Whelan. Um, and so this time round, we had actually really thought about this in advance. We had sort of, in a sense, wargamed you know, how we would appear and how we should appear. And um, uh, things like, you know, in 97, we produced 300 pages of briefing. Well, Gordon Brown never read one page of it. I know that. Um, I think Ed Balls would have read some of it. So we, you know, it, it, so we decided just to have 30 pages of briefing. And we got a really good guy who subsequently became the Prime Minister's Director of Communications to, to rewrite it so it was intelligible and not in civil service speak. And um, so I think, you know, all of this is, is perfectly doable. It helps if the incoming minister is of a um, high quality and has the ear of the prime minister. And George Osborne actually was, you know, he, he may not always come across brilliantly on television, but he's a fantastic person to work with and was very clear what he was about and, and actually enjoyed engaging with civil servants. He kind of enjoyed being chancellor, which was helps. And similarly, I mean, another example is 2015, where unusually I knew the shadow chancellor very well indeed. I mean, I'd, um, I'd known him by then for sort of 18, 19 years, 
been to his wedding, things like that. So kind of, you know, Osborne I didn't know at all actually before he became Shadow Chancellor, but Ed I knew very well. So that actually was, the cultural bit would have been dead easy had he got in. Um, I mean, he'd have had a demanding policy agenda, but, but the advantage when there's fairly rapid changeovers in power as there were in the sort of through the 60s and 70s is actually a people have been ministers before b you kind of know them um, and c in the old days actually the cultural elite was far smaller so most of these people have been at school with each other and so on <laughs> um, funny enough i did vaguely know david cameron because very briefly he was a special advisor to to norman de mont but i was some junior treasury official so i don't think we really um, have much to do with each other. The, the first contact is access talks, really, mm. first formal contact. Kath, I wanted to come to you briefly on this before we start to go out to the floor, but just uh, how important is that process for building those relationships ready for day one? What are the other things that are really key components of the access talks? Yeah, um, and relationships are a really important part of it. So this is um, the convention that has arisen um, to allow the opposition party to have meetings with um, the permanent secretary of the department, but often it's, it's now extended to other key officials where they can talk through the policy plans that they've got for office. Um, and they are incredibly important to the civil service for that reason, because it allows them to dig underneath the surface of what's in the manifesto, what's in public speeches and so forth, and understand what's behind the policy, what are the aims of the policy and, and, and you know, the kind of things that, that Wes has been talking about, what's the likely sequencing, how urgent is this, you know, how do you want to go about it so they can then plan for that. But they are also incredibly important for the relationship stuff that, that Nick has been talking about because in some cases, you know, th these people may know each other from select committees. They may have had briefings um, together, but often it's a very public relationship and shadows are seeing permanent secretaries as a public face of the government that they have been opposing for some years. So there is a sort of natural um, hesitancy there. But um, when they are trusting of each other going into these conversations, when they are dealt with confidentially, they can be really rewarding as a way of getting to know each other um, of you know within the limits of the talks because uh, civil servants cannot provide policy advice at that stage and they obviously can't give out anything confidential about the workings of the current government uh, but they can find ways to have uh, you know open up the conversation and start talking about the likely issues that they will face so when they work well they're incredibly rewarding for that and starting that relationship going. Wes wanted to come on this and then we'll get to questions from the Yeah, board. I mean, my experience in 2014, 15, I think we started ours in October, November 2014, was just how important and how valuable they were to the Shadow Cabinet. And also, you know, they forced us to do the work to get ready. Uh, and so whether we're five months from an election or 10 months from an election, I think it's, I actually think it's a bit of a disgrace that they haven't started already. I think these rumours are circulating about the Prime Minister worrying about the political signal that starting them would send and authorising them shows exactly why they should have started. Because I don't think that, if I'm honest, pretty strong view, I don't think the Prime Minister is actually acting in the interest of the country at the moment. This is about good governance. It's not about politics, it's about good governance. Um, I, and I think he's politicised a process that shouldn't be political. So, you know, I mean, he talked about professionalism, integrity, accountability. I mean, I think this is the opposite of professionalism in government. Um, I can see that Nick's kind of slightly biting his lip at this, but look, this is my personal view and knowing how important they were to our shadow coming in 2015. Uh, I mean, my, my, so I was a spad in the last Labour government and I knew they were going on and I didn't know anything about them, right? And that was, that was down to the professionalism of the civil service. Um, and when we uh, had them in 2014-15, you know, the, everything that every politician in Shadow Cabinet told me indicated that they were done with absolute integrity, complete professionalism, complete discretion. And I think, you know, you, you can deliver access to orcs immaculately and you can trust your civil service to do it and you can trust them to carry on governing to you as a Prime Minister. I mean, I think if he authorised them this week, Labour would say yes. And that's what I think he should do. Can I make one last point? Yes. One last point on this. Um, I think 
just coming back to the trust point, there is definitely a sense when you come in and there's been a, a, a Labour government, for example, in an hour for 13 years, and this might happen were Labour to win this time, of, oh, they'd been helping running the other team for a long time. And I think that is just a cultural feeling when you go in the door. You know who the people are, you've heard about them, they've been around for ages. I mean, it quite quickly dissipates, but I think that will be a theme you will see when, if there is a change. OK, I'm going to come to questions. If you wouldn't mind putting your hands up and we'll get a roving mic to you. We've got one by the door. I should also say, if there are others next door who would like to come in, please just pop your head round the door and I will try to come to you. <laughs> so we've got one here and then I will take uh, or one here and one here and then I'll come to the others. Thank you very much um, for the discussion. I think there are two things for, that need to be considered for opposition. First is decarbonisation for climate change. And the second is a real push for education. The UK is home of the Industrial Revolution. We really need to be pushing that further to make the difference. Um, there just isn't enough discussion on bringing in a carbon tax, bringing in a solution. We have six years before 2030, um, so it's not very far away. So two things really need to drive the um, opposition. And one here and next him. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to 97 again because I was a civil servant in the Cabinet Office in that year in something called the machinery of government. And what I remember, and I don't know whether um, Nick would agree, I remember a sense of really palpable excitement among the civil servants because Tories had been in power forever and it was going to be a very interventionist Labour government. So the Labour government came in and there were all sorts of very keen civil servants who wanted to do good things for them. My question to the panel is, is it the same now? Do you detect that excitement within the civil service about process of change? Uh, and if not, and I think the answer is no, to be honest, why not? Uh, I'm George Lear from IPPR. Um, Nick, you mentioned spending reviews. And I think if the election is quite late this year, let's say November, it'll be at the tail end of the existing spending review period. So I wanted to ask about the timing of that. What are the pros and cons of kind of calling a very quick spending review as soon as a new government comes in and what kind of pressures that puts on the incoming administration? Great, thank you. I think I might come to you first, Nick, on spending reviews, if that's okay, because given it was directly to you. And then I might come to Kath, uh, particularly on the civil service and then Kate and Wes, you should shout if there are other bits you want to come in on, including on the decarbonisation and education yeah. question. Nick? Um, well, on spending reviews, uh, we, we've kind of been in these situations before um, where, you know, they, they will have a very early choice about um, the... Um, what will be 25, 26... I mean, they're going to have to have a local government uh, settlement sometime in December. Um, so the, the big issue will be, do you have an immediate spending review? My guess is they won't. Um, but you need to set the plans. All governments, certainly George Osborne did, certainly Gordon Brown did, uh, and Geoffrey Howe did because... Dennis Healy's last budget was a care and maintenance one because they'd lost a um, confidence vote in 79. All of them had emergency budgets. So I'm quite sure Rachel Rees will have an emergency budget because that's just de rigueur. And it's an opportunity, to Kate's point, to set out um, the real priorities. So I guess they'll deal with the spending review then and there'll be certain programmes which they'll prioritise and so on. But my guess... And I have no idea what the Treasury's thinking is, but if I was still there, I'd be saying, look, let's buy some time and have a really in-depth review, which would be announced, say, in the autumn of uh, 25, take effect from April 26. Um, and I know I'm not allowed to ask the second question. No, no, but, please come in on whichever I think there's always, to. look, you join the civil service for for alternation of power, because otherwise it gets really quite dull after a while. <laughs> um, and I can remember after the 92 election thinking, God, is there never going to be a change of government? Um, and um, how wrong I was, because in 97 there was. So, so it's always exciting. It was exciting in 2010, the more so because of the sort of bizarre coalition. You know, I, w I went to Posh, 
this fantastic play about the Bullington Club on the night of the 2010 general election to get in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. McPherson... Hope we didn't disappoint you, Nick. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. McPherson got, kept sort of nudging me because I was looking at my then Blackberry about the results. I, I can remember being utterly astonished when I discovered that the Tories weren't going to get a majority. So, but these are, this is... This is what being a civil servant is about. Good times. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the twin side of what we were talking earlier about the nervousness that opposition parties then have. There is often a sort of fear that the civil service are looking for a change, like they're looking for a, a political change, whereas actually what they're looking often for is refresh of ideas or momentum. What the civil service want most is direction and to be doing stuff. Um, and, and so you only tend to see when it's, um, if there is an outgoing uh, administration, when it's at the tail end of that, when the government is losing, administration, uh, losing momentum. So, you know, a little bit in, in, in well, probably a lot in 97, a bit in 2009, 10, obviously off the back of the financial crash, there was a lot going on. Um, but I think it's actually this year you are in the second year of a, a new prime minister. So if there is direction coming from that prime minister, the civil service will still want to be delivering for the government of the day. And it's the same side of the, the kind of point about you want to be able to serve an alternative administration and show that's the benefits of the civil service, but you also want to show that you will continue to serve the government whilst they are the elected government of the day. So um, yes, there, there might be increasing enthusiasm and excitement and we do see that often you know civil servants are itching to get involved in the access talks or to the prep for for uh, the election that's going on in the department but permanent secretaries are usually quite good about trying to keep a damper <laughs> on that and not let too many people um, get involved with that because there's a, a day-to-day -day job to do as well yeah i just wanted to say and um, first of all just to reiterate that point about direction and ultimately power you know, the civil service, uh, my understanding is they like the system likes to be, you know, be t directed. And to do that effectively, you need power. And when power is being sort of slightly m messed around because the five families are meeting to tell you what, you know, the policy is, <laughs> that, that becomes quite problematic. And the second point I was just going to make is sometimes you have elections which are about we're tired of you rather than we're, we embrace the other. I mean, I, I think David Cameron wouldn't mind me saying that in 2010, I don't think the country thought, oh, we, we love David Cameron in the way they sort of fell in love with Tony Blair, but they had had enough of Labour. And that, you know, that, that feels more like where we are, not least because we don't know so much about the policies. I will read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my final point, because I want to pick up on the, on, on the policies you mentioned, very important, is... The other thing, just to bear in mind, I think governments tend to have only so much political currency to do big things at, a, at the same time. And that's one thing we discovered when we had you know, the financial crisis to deal with. There weren't so many other things we could do. So it would be interesting to see what they prioritise, who comes in next. And I think, I hope climate um, is one of them. Liz, did you want to come in on any I mean, uh, uh, there's lots of interesting things have been said already. I'll, I'll just pick up on your point about decarbonisation in education and actually Kate's point as well. You know, the breadth of issues that Labour says it will prioritise when it gets into power, if it gets into power at the next election, is significant and mobilising the government and the state to deliver those is going to be really challenging. You know, I mean... I think there is a choice at this election around decarbonisation and energy transition. Um, and, you know, I think Labour in Bridget Phillipson have a very impressive person in the education portfolio, an impressive politician, and it's one of those five, five missions. But, you know, capacity, political capacity that Kate talks about to deliver those things is really challenging. I'm going to do another round of questions in the room and then I've got uh, Slido ticking over in front of me. So can I go to the gentleman here in the middle of the second row um, and the gentleman on the end of the row after that? Uh, Paul Mason. Um, it's hard enough uh, for individual shadow um, ministers and their teams to, to mirror the existing department, but it, it looks to me from the outside impossible to, to 
anticipate or mirror what you do when you go into the cabinet office. Because it's fair to say that since ni Labour hasn't entered the cabinet office since 1997, and it's changed since then. So uh, what would be your advice to those who's, who, who have to, to deal with that? Because the, the subtext of the question is it's enormously powerful across government. The end. Uh, Lloyd, uh, it, it's an extension of that question to some extent. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, a tight-knit team who's fighting an election, hopefully they win an election, they go in, and then immediately they're dissipated. They're spread a, very thinly across a whole range of departments, some of which are priorities, some of which are not priorities. I'm fairly sure there are, perhaps, Catherine, you'll know this, one or two examples where the incoming team has said, hang on a minute, we are the team, you organise around us. I've got a feeling that New Zealand have done that. I've got a feeling that Alex Salmond in his first iteration for the SNP did that. What sort of advice can you give us about that sort of way of let's organise the system around what we want to do and how we prioritise rather than the other way? Thank you. Great. And the gentleman on the front, so we've done three. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Matthew Trimming. I'm Senior Advisor at Public, which is a uh, innovation and evaluation business for the public sector. Uh, I've had the privilege over the last 25 years of advising both Labour and Conservative governments, largely on tech, um, and seen a few transitions. Um, that's where I met Martin, actually. Um, and <laughs> nice to see him again. Um, and I'm just wondering, reflecting on the way transfers have worked in the past, there's always been a slight sense from an opposition party that, you know, ah, the civil service has become politicized under the particular incumbent. Culture war is a sort of loose and flabby and usually unhelpful phrase, but it is flying around a lot in the sort of political ether at the moment. And I'm just wondering whether that sort of uh, accusation of politicization is going to be more of a problem this time around rather than it has been in, in the past. I just yeah. value people's thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, Kate, I might come to you on the how do you kind of mirror and then think through coming into the centre of government, if that works for you. Yeah. And then um, why don't we just do a sweep of the panel and people can pick up comments. But okay. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that's a difficult one. I mean, I, I, I do seem to remember Steve Hilton, who was the sort of blue sky thinker of the early years in our team, said that Australia had only political advisors in the central building and all the officials were somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think that was going to work for us, but I, I see that's like that. I mean, in the end of the day, you know, if you have a good relationship with your officials, you should be able to work together in parallel to do the the ideas and the implementation. If you don't do that, then and the two are, are separated. I'm not sure that necessarily helps for, for good governments. But where I do agree is that there was definitely a sense of dissipation when we first came because we were, we were used to working in a, in a tight team, including with the shadow cabinet. And also, the, really, the political entities were only really one or two people, David Cameron, George Osborne. When you go into government, each member of the cabinet is a political figure in their own right. And then they have their spads and suddenly you have more leaps, more, you know, more fighting for the front pages. So it's a much more complicated um, political environment than it was when you were in opposition. I don't know how you necessarily solve that, if I'm frank, um, but I think it's, a, it's, a use, it's certainly a useful thing to, to note. Just one point on the polar, polarization point. I mean, I, I mentioned trust at the beginning. I think there is a sense of, oh, you've been helping the other team. I don't think that lasts for that long. And my sense is that um, there are more people, maybe, how should I put this, on the right of my party who are a little bit more sort of, all the civil service than there are maybe on the Labour side. I'm not sure that will be a huge problem. And just to the question on organising the system, were there any discussions? Did you, were you aware of any thinking you were doing on ra radically restructuring the system when you came in, or did you think so? I think this, yes, I think it's one of those things where machinery of government changes. Is I think Nick can jump in on this. What all civil servants hate the most, and I seem to remember Sir Jeremy Hayward saying, "Have you got any machinery of government things?" I don't. I think you know you've got to really focus on the big policy and not get. And I think that was excellent advice, actually. I mean, I can see why it was also in their interest. But you can spend quite a lot of time and energy when your 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 political focus should be 
elsewhere, for example, saving the economy or moving people around Whitehall. Sometimes it's good, but I don't know. It does also take up quite a lot of energy. So I would think carefully but before going in to do that, especially straight away. One of my previous jobs was also looking after the machinery of government team in the cabinet office. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, You'll know Wes, that. I wanted to come to you as well and thinking about how you mirrored the centre um, from when you were doing that in 2015. How did you think about how you would go into the centre of government? Well, I, I, look, I think hmm, there are many models about that float around about how you should organise the centre, and lots of people, including people in the institute, have had great thoughts and provide great advice to politicians about how they should organise the centre of government and you know we saw a big experiment in changing the centre uh, with Dominic Cummings in 2020, 20, 2019 maybe. I mean look we thought a lot about it and Charlie Faulkner who was our political lead I think had conversations with Jeremy, he Jeremy Haywood about it and about how it would be structured but when it comes down to it the, the key lesson that we were taking and you know Ed Miliband and Ed Balls as leader and shadow chancellor were focused on getting the relationships right mm -hmm. and focusing. But the other thing was delivery. We knew that if we had won, we would have been judged on delivery. And, uh, you know, that is about galvanising the centre to make sure that the departments, these new political entities that you create when you go into government, were delivering. I mean, I think the one just to think about machinery government change we you know we we heard the the advice very clearly about limiting machinery government changes and we i think the only proposal we had was to create a ministry of housing that was only uh machinery government change that, w that was on the table and i think you know if you look back at 2007 um when gordon brown became prime minister there were a few more tweaks to government that perhaps slowed things down yeah. a bit I'm going to come to you, Kath, and then Nick. And there are some other questions that I think are probably more for you, Nick, on the Slido. We have some people who are anonymous <coughs> asking questions about the civil service, which I assume will be civil servants at their desk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll Kath, and then I'll come to you, Nick. Um, uh, Paul, I mean, the very short answer to your question is Sue Gray. Um, you know, <laughs> so they do have experience of the Cabinet Office in more recent years. But it is an important point. I think some of what uh, Wes and Kate have been talking about, to go to your question, is particularly about number 10, mm. where it is a small operation and getting the people right and getting a really good functioning team is actually what is crucial there because ultimately, you know, the, the structures and so forth is often just a wiring diagram. It is the people that make a reality of that. I think when it comes to the Cabinet Office, it is more of a, a, a question to be asked about our centre of government and does it work as effectively as possible. The good news is that the Institute for Government has a commission looking <laughs> uh, at the centre of government and how it can be improved. And I think we'll be reporting uh, next month. So Watch um, out, February. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, yes, yeah, Sue Gray is uh, due to be looking at that. I think the really interesting question is what Wes raised earlier on, which is mission-led government. You know, does this mean a more fundamental change in the way in which a, a prime minister is directing, prioritising government. Obviously, Blair, it took him his second term to bring in PMDU, PMSU, um, and then Cameron uh, removed a lot of that because it was very much not invented here. So it's getting the balance right between getting those structures, which historically we know work for a centre of government and work effectively, and then working out what actually at our centre of government isn't working as effectively. And, and yes, probably the Cabinet Office needs a good look and, and a bit of a refresh, sorry. That's fine. And Nick, feel free to give your thoughts on any of those questions, but the ones that have come through on Slido, are how can civil servants brief on policy areas in access talks without giving policy advice? How do those briefings work without straying into advice? And the other is, how do you prepare for a smooth transition in departments where there'll be really big shifts in policy overnight? And I wondered if the sort of 2010 experience in the Treasury is a benchmark in which we can talk about how that transition worked within the department as a whole. I know you've touched on it briefly already, but how do you give advice in the, um, in the access, or how do you have conversations in access talks without straying into policy advice? And then how do you prepare for big transitions where the policy uh, changes almost overnight? Well, I think I can answer the first one. It actually relates to the questions about the Cabinet Office and whether you reorganise along Alex Salmon-type lines. Is that 
that the one, if you actually look at the fine print of discussions with oppos the opposition, it's to discuss factual questions of departmental organization. And it's to let departmental officials have some idea of the opposition's plans for changes in machinery of government. So the one thing which is totally legitimate to discuss <laughs> is machinery of government. And going back to um, my talks with George Osborne, actually there was a hell of a lot to discuss. There was the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, there was Office for Tax Reform, there was you know, rearranging the boundary between the Bank of England and the FSA. Um, there are a lot of other things too, which escaped me. Oh, I know, tax credits and um, uh, Office of Government Commerce. But so the endless opportunity, and if I was a cabinet office, if I was a cabinet secretary who understands back in post, um, I'd be focusing very much on how can you deliver a better functioning cabinet office? Because since David Cameron's day, um, you know, it's been knocked around a bit. Uh, you know, the Dominic Cummings period and so on, which I suspect may have, if it hasn't affected morale, I'd be somewhat surprised. So there's an opportunity there. Um, so I think on the policy thing, look, the most important thing is these things, look, in the end, you never quite know what's going to happen when there's a new government. I, th I think actually it's building relationships is most important. And the most important thing is to listen. You don't, you don't have to advise at this stage. You just want to get a sense of what really matters to them. And that's, that's about the explicit signals you get, but it's also the implicit ones. You, you know, if you've, I mean, I don't claim to be very emotionally intelligent, but if you've got any emotional intelligence, you can generally work out what, what is really behind what they're talking about and so on. So I think, I think you can make quite a lot of, a lot of progress on that. Um, what was the, do you have some other question? Well, anyway, politicization, I think mm. it's really, it's, it's really difficult in the run up to an election because actually you're always, as the departmental permanent secretary, you're always seen as someone who's helping the government of the day. I saw it the other week where I think the opposition rightly got slightly annoyed by some tweet which the treasury put out. <laughs> Should it have been put out by the Treasury or the Conservative Party? Mm. These are the sort of difficult issues about being a permanent secretary. Um, I had the problem, that the worst thing about the, being in the Treasury in the run-up to the election is the awful process of opposition costings, mm. where the government of the day gets the Treasury to cost policies which they allege are the opposition's. And that, you know, you haven't arrived as a permanent secretary until you've been shouted at by the, exist the current shadow chancellor um, about how this is terrible and why are you doing it and surely it breaks every code in the book. I've got a couple more questions in Slido before we wrap up. Uh, one which I think uh, goes well to you, Kath, as the director of the IFG Academy. Mm. Um, what preparations and or training do potential ministers receive to prepare them to take an office of state? Has this changed over the years? And then to Wes and Kate, there's some questions about what, what exactly does hitting the uh, ground running look like? Mm -hmm. And it would be helpful to hear uh, in your plans ahead of 2010 and then 2015, what had you gamed out as what you would want to do to really hit the ground, even if at least in 2010 coalition talks got in the way? Mm -hmm. But Kath on training. Okay, uh, I'll try and go quickly. Um, so we, as you mentioned earlier, have a great archive of uh, former ministers called Ministers Reflect. We've got over 150 former ministers. And almost all of them say what Kate said earlier on, which is you're just thrown in and you get very little support. Um, that has improved somewhat um, over the years. The Cabinet Office do now provide uh, various sort of training sessions, the IFG often run sessions for new ministers and um, our colleague Tim Durrant who leads our ministers team has an excellent selection of guides available on our website uh, for new ministers and is further <laughs> developing the curriculum for new ministers and for new special advisors who should not be forgotten. Um, so more has been done, more can be done. The biggest problem though is that as you know we've been discussing when you're a new minister you're just thrown in to the work, to the job, and it is really difficult to find the time for this kind of thing to allow you to sit back and think, 
how are we doing? What could we do differently? And, and that's the key issue is actually just prioritizing, um, allowing ministers to get up to speed doing the job and to understand that it is a process and that they don't instantly get, come into the job, change overnight, and suddenly they are um, firing all, on all cylinders. And we should be a bit more understanding of um, providing them with that kind of ability to, to learn and to improve and to be supported. So the thing that's changed is the creation of the IFG. Yeah, that's the main um, thing that has, well, and particularly the Academy CR online resources. Um, I'm going to come to you, Kate, and then Uez for the final word. What does hitting the ground running really look like? So you have a grid ready to go. As I said um, earlier, you, you want to do a couple of things that speak to the, the values and are symbolic of the direction which you want to take the country. Obviously, you want to do you know, the Queen in the front door. Um, in, in 2010, um, all the plans got thrown out because we were in coalition talks. So the first really strong memory I think most people had of that government was David Cameron and Nick Clegg in the Rose Garden, which, which spoke to a different type of government, I think was very strong in itself. And then, of course, you had some things, for example, David Cameron set up the National Security Council, which met. So those are two examples going straight in, of course, to the emergency budget, you know, a tour of the four nations and then to the first G8. In, in 2015, funnily enough, we weren't prepared at all. We didn't think we were going to, we, we were worried we wouldn't win. We certainly thought we might have difficulty forming a, a, a party. And there was a moment in um, the gym in Whitney where I was lucky enough to be for the count sitting next to David Cameron when about three in the morning, none eight and result came through when um, we realised that we might, we were actually going to win a, a majority. And then it occurred to David that he was going to have to go down and, and do a speech because he, he just rewon his seat. <laughs> um, and so we had to think pretty quickly about what that was all going to be. And, and that's when he, he sort of talked about returning to some of those more early Cameron values of sort of um, one nation conservatism. So that was cobbled together pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> Well, if the vote that Kate mentioned had gone the other way, what would have the well, 70s here? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. it was, so this was it. I, I mean, I am. Um, uh, we, we've done a lot of thinking about other parties and discussions that we might have to have with other parties. Um, uh, and I remember um, kind of coming into London with my big bag full of like two suits and four shirts and that was how long it would take and all of that and we learned the lessons of 2010 and thought you know we, we, we knew how we were going to handle it and obviously it became completely irrelevant but um <laughs> <laughs> we we uh we, you know we in terms of hitting the ground running we had had some thoughts about what what would happen once it was confirmed that you know labor had won and ed Miliband was going to be prime minister and that was obviously there but we'd also thought a lot about how each department and each big political priority was going to act in the first week and the first month, and the, uh, I know Kath hates it, but the first 100 days. And, you know, <laughs> and that sense of thinking about what the future might look for each of those departments. And we'd, we'd actually summed it up in closure notes that we'd sent to all the permanent secretaries as, as well, saying, you know, this is what we want to do. So there was a, there was a I mean, I think your report captures it. Uh, and actually, I should mention a, a paper that I wrote with Alan Wager uh, in the past about this as well. We, we talk about how you can't prepare for the whirlwind that hits you. And I think, you know, you, you've all talked about it. But, but we wanted to sort of provide some guide rails for what was going to be that Labour government. And then, who knows? That is a, a good point for us to close on. I'm very sorry to those who I've not been able to get to your questions, both in the room, uh, and online, but I hope you can all join me in giving a massive round of applause to our excellent panellists. So thank you very much. Uh, we have mentioned three things from the IFG during this conversation, which I will remind you of before you leave. Our excellent paper on exactly this topic, which you can find online the forthcoming Centre Commission, which will be coming out in February, and the wonderful IFG Academy and all of the resources for those who are eyeing up what it could mean to uh, transition into government. So thank you all very much, and see you all again soon. Thank you.